bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Holland Blurview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. Today's webinar is titled Building Bridges, Moving Research to Practice and this is part two. Uh, continuing from last week's presentation where part one introduced us to the National Implementation Research Network's active implementation frameworks as uh, presented to us by our colleagues from Glen Rose who have come back to join us again. Um, once again, just a reminder, when this topic came to us from our rehab network, uh, CINSER, the Canadian Network of Child and Youth Rehab, that's uh, the network of CAFC's rehab members that are interested in uh, improving uh, rehab services for children and youth. And uh, we may or may not have the co-chair uh, of, of CINSER's KT and Research Committee, Dr. Gail Andrew. She joined us last week just to give us a little context and sort of help me co-host this session. She's uh, in clinic right now and may or may not make it on time, but she may join us a little bit later in the presentation. So. All right, so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our panel. Uh, so once again, we are, it's our pleasure to welcome back our colleagues from the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital in, Ed in Edmonton. And with us today, uh, we, had, uh, we have uh, Cindy Koning. Uh, and Cindy uh, is a, a knowledge mobilization specialist for the Canadian Spinal Cord Injury Knowledge Mobilization Network and is on the, uh, and, and also for the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital Healthcare Improvement Team. Uh, she has her PhD in Rehabilitation Medicine from the University of University of Alberta and has spent more than 20 years as an occupational therapist uh, working in adolescent psychiatry and assessment and diagnostic clinics in developmental pediatrics. And joining Cindy, we are it's our pleasure to welcome back to the presentation from, you might remember her from part one last week, uh, Laura Mummy, who is the Knowledge Mobilization Consultant at the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital in Edmonton. And she's also a member of the Glen Rose uh, Healthcare Improvement Team, which supports evidence-based clinical practice across the site through an integrated approach to research, outcomes evaluation, knowledge mobilization, and quality improvement. So it's our pleasure to welcome back uh, our colleagues from the Glen Rose. Well, it's our, so I'll hand the virtual podium over to you guys. Thanks so much, Doug. Uh, my name is Laura, and I just want to welcome everyone, as well as welcome anyone who is attending this, who attended the first session back for the second session. Those who um, were unable to attend the first session, it did provide um, a lot of the background information of this implementation science framework that we're going to talk about how we use today. And I do suggest you reference to that so that, because uh, uh, we're not going to touch today on a lot on uh, the concepts of the implementation science, but really how we applied it and how we used it in a practical setting. So today, we're, our example that we're going to highlight is the implementation of best practice in autism spectrum diagnosis, disorder diagnosis, and our um, experience on what worked, what didn't, and how we really use this implementation science framework effectively to influence practice change. So we're trying to get, to get as practical as possible and less on the theory bit. So our objectives for today are fairly straightforward. Uh, we're going to basically demonstrate how we've applied the implementation science framework through our example. We're also going to talk about how it, the importance of defining the core components or the essential pieces of the evidence-based practice that helps facilitate our implementation success, so really defining what we want to implement. And we're also going to describe how we used uh, improvement cycles or the PDSA cycle specifically to um, basically improve our changes that we're making in practice on a continuous basis in a more systematic, planful way. <coughs> 
So just to highlight a little bit about what we learned last time, and we'll be saying reminders throughout this presentation. I'll be, I'll be coming in, um, Cindy and I will kind of be doing a back and forth throughout the whole presentation. I'll be providing that implementation science lens, and Cindy will be providing the practical application. So last time we focused a lot on na the National Implementation Research Network's stages of implementation that you see on the screen here right now. So there's four stages exploration, installation, initial implementation, and full implementation. And even though they're kind of presented in this linear format, you really can cycle through them back and forth, with this, which is represented by the multi-directional arrows there. And there's also a lot of overlap in between those stages. So just because you might be considered finished one doesn't mean you can't start the next stage um, in, in your implementation process of your best practice. We also talked about that this process does take time and that it takes approximately two to four years, not until anything starts or until anything happens, but until you're seeing a permanent, sustainable, effective change and you're seeing the outcomes that you're wanting to see from your um, implementation of your evidence-based practice. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be breaking down each of these stages and uh, highlighting some key activities that we did in our um, ASD diagnosis implementation team that helped us not only complete these stages, but move through to sustainable implementation. And then we'll also talk about some next steps that we are planning to do in the project. So let's start off with um, looking at what our team did in exploration. And just a friendly reminder that the uh, exploration stage is all about what to implement. But before we get to that, we're going to just set the stage a little bit for why we did a project in ASD diagnosis. So Cindy's going to take care of this part. Okay, so um, we're going to keep saying the word ASD. So, um, and I know that um, not everybody will right away get what that is, but. I'll, I'll try to remind people that when we say ASD, we're, we mean Autism Spectrum Disorder. So we at the Glen Rose um, diagnose more than 600 children each year with um, Autism Spectrum Disorder. And so it became quite important for us to look at how that was happening because the numbers were increasing. Um, at the same time as we were sort of aware that we needed to address um, ASD diagnosis here at the Glen Rose, we were undergoing a process of pediatric redesign. And during that process, there were extensive stakeholder focus groups, which led to a greater focus on family-centered care, informed clinical judgment, evidence-based practice, a real um, focus on standardized practice um, and collaboration. And coincidentally, at the same time, the DSM-5 criteria had changed or were in the process of, of changing so that we would need to be applying new um, diagnostic criteria to the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And we wanted to do all of this within the developmental context. So we had these two forces that were working kind of, or three forces, I guess, that were wor working at the same time. We had this expertise that was developing in knowledge mobilization. We had this pediatric redesign happening. And then there was a greater focus on, on standardizing practice in ASD diagnosis. So what did we set out to do? One of the most important things, um, obviously, for any implementation project is to to look at what is available in the literature, what is what does the evidence say. And we knew already, and I'm sure anyone who works in ASD knows, that there are many, many clinical best practice guidelines available. Pretty much every country um, has more than one set of ASD criteria for diagnosis. So we knew they were out there, um, and we knew we needed to pick pick a good one that would work for our context. Um, we, we also knew that we needed to examine the supports that would be needed to implement guidelines. And by supports, um, that, that word, the word that we often use is drivers. So that word is probably not familiar to a lot of people, but it is an implementation science kind of word. So, so when we use the word supports or drivers, we're looking at what the um, 
enables and um, challenges implementation. Then we needed to, of course, implement the guidelines. And as part of the whole process, we knew from a work in, in other knowledge mobilization projects that we needed to evaluate um, both the outcome of implementation, were the guidelines that we chose implemented with fidelity, and also the process, were we successful in applying implementation science to autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. So, you, um, you know, I, I believe that our process for um, providing a, a family with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder was not, it was, it was actually, we were actually doing quite well in that in many ways, but there was a sense that there was quite a bit of vari variability in practice across programs and clinics. So we had um, preschool clinics, school age clinics, we had, we had programs where children attended for six weeks where autism diagnosis was happening. We knew that we had best practice guidelines, but we hadn't systematically um, implemented them. And I'd love to hear from anyone else who has systematically implemented autism spectrum disorder diagnosis guidelines. So if you've done that, um, that would be a great collaboration. We also wanted to align our diagnostic services with all of the pediatric redesign con um, concepts that we had decided on in the focus groups that were ran for that. Um, and finally, at the beginning of our work, we knew that the DSM-5 criteria for ASD were about to be published and that we would quickly want to adapt our practice to reflect the new criteria, at least partially because our site is um, one of the Autism Treatment Network sites. So Cindy has just described kind of um, the need for really which this work needed to happen and, and why we, we, why we chose ASD diagnosis as um, an area to really apply this implementation science framework. So really now, once we've established why we wanted to do this, we needed to figure out, well, how are we actually going to do the implementation and how are we going to make it work and make it sustainable? And this is a slide from last week's presentation that was a really simple way to, to highlight making this work happen, making this work sustainable and achieving the outcomes that we wanted to achieve. So first we need, really need to know, well, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to implement in ASD diagnosis? How is that going to happen? So what are the steps and the strategies that we're going to go through and the thoughtful changes we're going to make in order to make that change stick? And finally, who needs to be involved? So not only who needs to be involved in facilitating the change, but who are going to be those first implementers, those clinicians on the front line that are going to be making the change on a daily basis. So here's that first stage of implementation I was talking about in the beginning, um, which is called exploration. And simply put, it's just deciding what we want to implement. And there's different strategies we um, can do to, to achieve that goal. And Cindy's going to talk about that a little bit. But we're going to highlight three main activities that we as a team um, achieved in exploration. First, we're going to describe on how we figured out what to implement in ASD diagnosis. The second thing we're going to talk about is how we built an implementation team to take on this work and make these decisions and these changes. And finally, we're going to talk about um, how we really defined our practice using a tool. And this tool um, is, is an implementation science tool developed by the National Implementation Research Network called a practice profile tool. And this is a very practical tool that we've used on the site many, many times um, to really help guide the definition of our practice and set the stage for um, implementation changes moving forward. And I'll talk a little bit more about this tool as we um, get into the exploration stage. All right, so we had to choose what to implement. So as you know, there are, or as you may know, there are many different sets of guidelines. And what we, we first did was narrow it down to three sets. We looked at um, two from Canada, the Merriam Foundation guidelines and the British Columbia guidelines for autism diagnosis. And then one from the UK called the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence guidelines for ASD diagnosis. All of these guidelines offered similar approaches to what and how assessment for autism should take place. 
So this actually, this one slide, it's funny, you know, you can write a slide and think, oh man, there was a lot of work that went into that. In addition to um, the implementation team, which we'll talk about in a little while, we had an advisory team. And that advisory team um, had to go through these three sets of guidelines and figure out what exactly would work for us. And they had to do that using an on, a modified online Delphi voting strategy. And in this strategy, they were um, asked to look at all of the different components of an autism diagnosis and make decisions about priority, or what we should be focusing on. And the decisions were made using fairly well-defined criteria, including whether or not something was evidence-based, the importance and impact for the family, the feasibility, that which, and by that we mean all the resources and organizational support that might be needed, the sustainability and scalability of um, that particular component, and then the fit with the pediatric redesign principles. So all these guidelines from the three sets were entered into the online Delphi survey, and our advisory team voted in three rounds to narrow our choice down. And I think it's important when you're figuring out exactly what to implement that you look at um, who is making that decision quite carefully. So we chose that advisory uh, team to, so that it would have representative participants from various stakeholder groups. We had clinicians, parents, community service providers, uh, administrators, and autism experts vote uh, in this process to determine what we needed to work on first at the Glen Rose. So I think it's also important that what you see on the screen right now is what we actually decided on, but that deciding on these components didn't ex exclude other essential components. So there were other things, obviously, that go into making a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder that aren't included, either because they were already well established and well done, or because um, they didn't fit within, they, they weren't, they didn't arrive, we didn't arrive at that um, decision based on the criteria for decision making. So um, I, I also think it's important to note that when you're implementing best practice changes, you may feel that you're doing a pretty good job already in some areas, but um, but it's interesting to note that the whole implementation framework allows you to do something with consistency, and that's um, consistency and sustainability, and those are two very important um, components. So here we are at the final decision after um, probably it took us, I would say, four to six months to do this De online Delphi voting system because everybody had a, needed to have an opportunity to discuss and decide what would, be, um, what would be implemented. So the two big areas we decided on were to integrate information from all sources together with clinical judgment to diagnose um, children based on current DSM criteria. And we left it current because we um, recognized that that may change over time. So DSM-5 may become D DSM-6 or... And that the essential components um, that we were going to address in this implementation were the developmental history, the structured observation of the child, which was typically done do, um, using the autism diagnostic observation schedule, uh, a communication assessment, and a psychological assessment. So the next step after that decision was made, um, and, and some of these things occur somewhat simultaneously, so it's not exactly linear as Laura has said, was to build an implementation team. This is a critical step, and, it's, and I can't sort of emphasize this enough in terms of practicality with all of our more than, I would say, 16 to 20 implementation teams that we have across the hospital. This is very critical, that you have an implementation team that works um, for this for your particular project because the success of implementation relies at least partially on this team's ability to fa facilitate change and their commitment to the process. So we we found that it's really important to consider both influencers like people uh, like leaders and um, organizational support and the people who will actually be implementing and using the practice change. <coughs> 
And then finally, a really critical thing, which we didn't actually come into right away on some of our teams, was to consider who will be the recipients of the change. And for us, in this particular project, it was um, parents and families of children who were receiving an autism diagnosis and community um, referral sources. So those stakeholders were also included on our implementation team. So this next slide has actual names of the people who are on our implementation team. Um, these are the people who really make it happen. And I have to say we had incredible engagement from the clinic coordinators for preschool and school-age neurodevelopmental clinics, from a pediatrician who worked on both clinics and is an um, ASD expert, a manager, a parent, an Edmonton public school psychologist, a Glenrose psychologist, psychologist and knowledge mobilization consultants. Um, this diverse group also re represented various disciplines because obviously that was important. So coincidentally, um, the manager and, and two of the clinic coordinators are also um, speech language pathologists, so we had some representation from them. Um, and I think the, the diversity of people on this team and the levels of systems that they represent allowed us to promote and participate in systems change at multiple levels. So when you're making changes on a pretty big scale, it's really important to consider that. Um, and I want to say that this was a very committed group. We met biweekly for at least 12 months, and then eventually that, that um, meet, amount of meeting time changed. But it was really um, very focused kind of work. So the third thing that uh, once our implementation team was formed and once we had chosen our best practices that we wanted to implement, it was important to now um, look at this tool that I talked about called the practice profile. And this tool's main um, objective is really to clearly define what you are implementing and really be able to think about what does it look like every day operationally on the front line so answering those questions of what this looks like, who's involved, where does it happen, when does it occur, and, and how you can see that happening in day-to-day -pract -day practice. So we're really talking about defining what we implement so that your whole implementation team is on the same page. And this is a great tool to also help with your communication of what you're implementing and really setting the standards for your, your practice. So how do we create a practice profile. And I'm going to show you what that tool looks like in a second. But really, um, you start off with, like I said, clearly defining those essential or critical or non-negotiable pieces of your practice that if they did not exist, the practice wouldn't be um, delivered the way it was intended. And you want to define it in three different ways. You want to look at it, OK, ideally within your context, how could this practice be delivered? And, and what does that actually look like? Then you also want to say, well, because we live in a crazy healthcare environment, because things are complex and our environment is ever changing, how do we, um, how do we manage those changes so that we don't feel like we're not achieving our ideal implementation standards of that practice? So it's important also to define what's acceptable for the practice to look like um, and really be able to set those boundaries between ideal and acceptable so that, so that you can um, uh, account for those um, out of control changes or those one-offs that might, that might come into your, your practice or your clinic or your unit so that you're not failing. We, wanna, we all want to always be working towards ideal implementation, but it's also important to define acceptably what that practice could look like. Equally as important, it's also um, important that you look at what's unacceptable in terms of your practice delivery. So you have your ideal implementation, you have what's acceptable implementation of your practice, and then what's unacceptable. From that, then it's also important to look at who's delivering the practice. And what are the knowledge, skills, abilities, experience, attitudes that are critical to support the delivery of that practice? And this will help really inform what type of training you might need and also about who you could potentially select for delivering the practice. 
The third piece is then to look at these drivers that Cindy was talking about a little bit earlier. So these key areas that you really need to have a discussion around and think about how can this area support the delivery of our practice. And these drivers specifically, there's one group that supports the clinicians and the clinicians specifically around their competence and their confidence in delivering the practice. So what supports in those areas can we make a plan for in order to help support our clinicians deliver the practice ideally as we defined it. And the fourth piece is also looking at those supports or those drivers, those key areas that are really going to support the practice from a more organizational perspective, those systems, those process pieces, those administrative pieces, those culture change pieces um, that can really once again support our practice and to be delivered the way we defined it in step one. So here's what the tool looks like. This is, um, the tools actually consists of four pages of activities, but we're going to focus on this first activity because it's really important to set the stage by defining, as you can see here in columns two, three, and four, what we ideally want to see in terms of our practice delivery, what is still acceptable to account for those uncontrollable changes that may happen in our environment, in our practice, and then also what is absolutely unacceptable in our practice. So Cindy is going to talk a little bit about some examples of what um, ideal, acceptable, and unacceptable look like. Okay, before we start that, I thought I'd just quickly remind you um, what the practice areas were that we decided on that were, um, that were decided during the online Delphi pro process because these were the practice areas that needed to be spelled out in the practice profiles. So we wanted to integrate information from all sources together with clinical judgment to diagnose children based on current DSM criteria. We had decided that there were several essential components not exclusive to other components that were already well addressed at the Glen Rose, but we decided that we would address developmental history, structured observation of the child, communication assessment, and psychological assessment. So you, can, you might think that a developmental history or a cognitive assessment um, might seem like a fairly clear, distinct component, but we cr quickly discovered that there was quite a lot of variability in how each of these areas were being viewed by clinicians. So we needed to pull together what everyone was already doing, go back to the guidelines and get input from various groups to figure out how the components would be de defined. Um, this was probably, um, well, this is also a fairly labor-intensive area because we needed to make sure we got this right. So defining the components and getting consensus on it took a fair bit of time from all the different clinicians who, um, who we sought input from. Um, what we'll show you next is a few examples of things, um, of some of the components. And, and you will see that there is more than one component, obviously, to a developmental history. There are many components. There are many components to a communication assessment or, or even a structured observation. So, so we're only going to take one little bit of each of these to show you um, what the practice, a little bit of what a practice profile looks like so that you have some idea of how um, of how this actually worked out. So this is the first example, the integration of DSM-5 criteria. And we had um, a definition for that. What, what would that mean? And for us, it was information obtained related to the diagnostic criteria is considered in diagnostic decision making. Information may be directly obtained during the assessment and or provided by parent or carer report and or contained in documents provided by the assessment. Um, so these were things that we received from, say, the community or from other, um, other health care providers. So you can already see that some of that um, helps to define a critical component. So we decided, and I'll only go through the ideal one right now, that all members of the team, and that was important because we're very, um, the, at the Glen Rose, we really focus on an interprofessional model. Um, to, a, to some extent, a multidisciplinary model, but we're aiming for an interprofessional kind of discussion. So all members of the team are present to discuss findings and contribute relevant information from all sources. 
and the DSM criteria, diagnostic criteria are considered individually and sources of information are noted. So we were really looking for the evidence for the different criteria. And then documentation of this process becomes part of the child's file. So um, I won't go through uh, the unacceptable or the acceptable, but we did sort of um, really consider what would be okay, what would be enough to make, uh, to make sure that we had done this integration of DSM-5 criteria. All right, another example is um, the structured observation. So as part of a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, we needed to have some systematic observation of the child in routine context and, in or, and or in structured tasks like a standardized assessment. And for this, at the Glen Rose, we, we typically, ideally, use the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule 2. And um, the ideal standard for that would be that it would be completed and interpreted by a research-reliable ADOS2 administrator. And for any of you who know something about um, the ADOS, um, achieving research reliability is not the simplest thing in the world. All right, cognitive assessment. Now, this is interesting because this is part of the psychological assessment. So this is only one component of the psychological assessment. So there were many different parts that were defined. Um, but what we're showing you is probably one of the more straightforward ones, which is basically looking at um, uh, measures of IQ. So we, the psychologists got together, and, and they, it's interesting, um, they were quite explicit about what would be uh, acceptable and what would be ideal in terms of actual measures, where um, some of the other disciplines, like the speech language pathology, were more, more concerned about specific components versus specific measures. So um, in some ways, uh, achieving ideal uh, implementation of cognitive assessment was a little bit more straightforward in that um, clinicians knew exactly which measures needed to be done in order for um, an assessment, needed to be done and when they needed to be done in order for an assessment to be considered ideal. I won't go through them all there, but if you're interested, those are the ones that our group chose. So as you can see, the three main activities that we um, highlighted today in our exploration stage was to really figure out what we wanted to implement by doing a literature search and an online voting process with a group of experts. Then once that was completed, we put together our implementation team, the people who are going to be making those changes and making the decisions and making it happen, and to really uh, be accountable for the, the change in practice. And then finally, um, our implementation team got together and with the use of the practice pro profile tool was guided to help define our practice. So once we achieved all of that, we're going to move into now our installation stage, which is really about making our plan. So we've defined what we want to see in our practice. We've set our standards of what is ideal, acceptable, and unacceptable in our practice. But how are we actually going to make that happen? What are the specific changes we're going to be making um, to help facilitate that implementation? So that's really the main objective of, of this installation stage, which really is just a planning stage of how this is all going to work. So here are the three key activities we're going to highlight today as examples of how we achieve these. So we're going to talk about those implementation drivers, so those key supports, those areas that are really going to help um, support our implementation of our practice and support our clinicians and all the systems needed to make sure the practice is sustainable and achieving the outcomes that we set. We're also going to talk about um, how assessing those implementation drivers really helped form our implementation plan or our work plan or our action plan, however you'd like to call it. And finally, we're going to talk about, well, what changes did we actually make in order to um, support the implementation before we, we tried all the new um, practice changes out. So here's a slide from last presentation. These are the eight uh, National Implementation Research Network implementation drivers. And once again, drivers is this 
kind of new implementation science word, but it really means these areas to help support your implementation. So um, on the left-hand side of this triangle, you can see that we have um, selection, training, and coaching, which really all support our staff or support the clinicians to do the practice. So selection around who's doing the practice, and um, what are their knowledge, skills, and abilities required to do the practice. Training is how do we train up those knowledge, skills, and abilities. What do they need to know and how are we going to, to give them that information. Coaching, once those skills have been trained, um, how are we going to support them moving forward and to ensure that we don't have any practice drifts and that we're really um, supporting and reinforcing those new skills that are being learned and used. On the right-hand side of the triangle, we have these organizational supports. So these drivers really deal with the systems and the environment needed to support the new practice. So things like decision support data systems, which really just means what are you going to do with the information that you receive? How are you going to communicate information um, on these new processes and if you're achieving your outcomes or not? Facilitated administration is really about, from an administration perspective, um, how can we support the new practice? So say your manager could get involved and relieve maybe some of the time it's taking to um, sit on an implementation team, or perhaps um, the manager can help push forward a new policy or procedure or standard or guideline or process or protocol that needs to be developed and approved in order to um, uh, have the practice be delivered the way it was intended. And finally, systems intervention. So what are those um, what are those process pieces or perhaps cultural um, the cultural environment in which you're making the change? And if the change is going to impact any of that um, uh, implementation culture or staff culture, and really from a system perspective, how can you support it? All of these really feed up into the performance assessment piece, which is all about what are you going to measure to say that you're doing what you said you're going to do, that fidelity piece. How accurately are you doing what you said you're going to do? And creating a plan for what you're going to collect in terms of data. At the base of this triangle is a critical piece that we have found um, that has been present in all our implementation teams and really been a strong um, uh, driver for change has been the leadership piece, ensuring that we're engaging the right decision makers at the right time to help us through our challenges, to help make critical decisions along the way, and to help support us through all of this change. As you notice that um, your implementation team, as we're going to talk about today, did not spend a lot of time in each of these. We absolutely, as an implementation team, talked about each one of these eight areas, but we might have discovered that we're quite strong in one of those areas or that we had very little control in one of those areas and that we really needed to do more work in another area. And that's the great part about these drivers is that if you're weak in one area, you can compensate with the strength in another area. Or you might have to do more work to build up the strength in one of these areas. And that's OK. So we're going to talk about a few of the drivers and how they related to us and what are the key actions that we really did in some of these drivers where we spent the most of our time and our work. So selection, just a little reminder, selection refers to selecting the right people to do the, the work, and in this case, the diagnosis of children with ASD. And we felt initially that we probably didn't have a lot of control over who was hired, for example, whether they actually had skills in making an autism diagnosis, because people here at the Glen Rose, like many other places, work in multiple different clinics. Um, but we did decide on some key activities. We thought we should list the competencies and skills for each discipline involved in the ASD diagnosis, provide a list of um, preferred prerequisites, and maybe develop a behavioral vignette that addresses um, the ability to work with it within an interdisciplinary team. Unfortunately, this was not something we got a lot of traction on initially, so this driver was probably not that well addressed initially in the, in the development of the whole implementation plan. Um, but just recently, we've decided to revisit this one and look at it again and see whether we can't actually do some of this work. 
probably not just for autism diagnosis, but for other diagnoses as well. So in terms of training, this is an area where we had a lot of, um, we put a lot of work into the actual training. We held lunch and learn sessions um, that were videotaped and available through telehealth to many different sites, so including all of, I, I, I think anyone across Canada could actually sign in, and we at some points had more than 30 different um, uh, sites sign into these telehealth sessions. And these sessions were um, really designed to look at the critical components and provide some, some basic and um, critical information, for example, around um, the DSM-5 criteria or the developmental interview. Uh, at the same time, we obviously had to do some very specific training in very specific measures that were important for each um, clinician. So um, at the same time, we were working on ADOS, or the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule II um, fidelity measures. We developed a package of training materials and made that available on a shared drive. Um, which included everything from videos and websites and articles. And we're just now, it's interesting, you know, when you develop something, you think, oh, this is excellent. And then two years later, you realize, whoa, we really need to do some updating so that we're, we stay um, evidence-based and we have the most current information available. Along with that sort of training package, we developed um, a written coaching service delivery plan. Yvonne Bowen, please call the Sorry about, the, Bowen, call the sorry about the overhead. It's really loud in my office. Um, we, we developed this written coaching plan that would allow um, both new people to the process of diagnose, diagnosis in autism and um, clinicians who are already working in those clinics to learn more um, in areas that they had identified as challenges for them. So, for example, a new clinician might need to know everything there was to know about um, uh, DSM-5 criteria for autism diagnosis, where a clinician who'd worked many years might need to know more about um, diagnosing autism in a very specific population of children. So we thought it would be good to Yvonne identify Bowen, coaches. Call the switchboard. Yvonne Bowen, call the switchboard. Sorry about that. Um, but as it turned out later in the, in the development of the process, we decided that it would probably be best if in some ways the clinicians or the new people could choose coaches. Well, obviously, if they needed help, we would help them with that. Choose a coach that would work for them. Um, we also identified what skills were going to be coached and the goals to be, to be achieved. Um, during the mentor and mentee relationship. In addition to that, I'm not sure I have a slide on that, but in addition to that, we did develop an evaluation plan for that process as well. So in terms of staff competency, um, we had to have some fidelity measures, obviously. And the, one of the, this seems like a very simple thing, but having access to all the same information and databases and resources was really important. So we set up a shared drive um, for the ASD diagnosis team. So that um, allowed clinicians um, to access all the resources that they needed. We also worked really hard on developing an audit system, which um, I think worked actually quite well. And, and if anyone is really interested in that, we would we could probably share that because we built it out of the NICE guidelines, the um, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence Guidelines Audit. So they had already um, a system for auditing how well you were doing, um, how well you were implementing a particular guideline. So we used that, um, it's, it's based on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, to do that work. And of course, um, because we were collecting data that was outside of what we would normally collect, we had to go through the whole ethics approval um, process. So we had to I also then identify who would collect the data and complete the audit, um, build the coaching evaluation survey. Um, uh, and these are just examples, because there are obviously many more measures. We needed to look exactly how um, how many we were uh, how many ideal, acceptable, and not acceptable 
were being achieved. And we also wanted to know why something um, was not acceptable or why we had only achieved acceptable. So that would give us an opportunity to improve practice later on when we looked at this data. So in terms of organizational supports, or the driver called um, systems intervention, we knew that there was somewhat inconsistent documentation of the DSM criteria at the Glen Rose. Um, probably more consistent than many places because we are an autism treatment network site. But um, we were looking to go beyond just having um, a checklist of whether the criteria had been met or not. We wanted to look at whether or not there was evidence and how we had how we had got how, how we had that evidence had been found. So um, we developed a form. This is our system solution. We developed a form that was based on the Autism Treatment Network DSM-5 form, but this included three columns, or actually four. The four columns were heard it, and by that we meant um, that we had heard it from the parents or from the child. We had read it. So that meant we had looked, we had seen that somewhere in um, previous documentation, or that we had seen it during the actual assessment process. Because for us, uh, many of the children come in for a full day or full two days of assessment. And then the fourth column was um, a brief description of where that evidence came from. Obviously, there was a lot more extensive um, documentation that occurred by in, in a composite kind of report, but um, we wanted a quick reference guide that actually would say where that evidence came from. All right, and then the leadership driver. I can't emphasize how important this was. And this is really important when you set up an implementation team, too, that you include um, the people who will be actually doing the implementation. But you also include some the leaders who will um, facilitate the change. So the director of pediatrics here at the Glen Rose played a really key role both in communication and in um, in getting support to apply for additional funding for this work because obviously it was um, it does take a little bit of time and effort and then also the whole concept of spread so spreading to other diagnostic groups spreading to other um, components of the ASD diagnosis assessment that has been enabled by the by the leadership here. So as you can see, we spent we did a lot of work in both the exploration and our planning stage, um, and addressed those uh, those drivers or those areas such as training and coaching and leadership and our systems to really inform us not only um, what we'd like to see, but also what changes we might have to be made or what forms or materials needed to be developed um, and made as action items before we actually implement a change in our ASD diagnosis practice. So we spent a lot of time in those two stages. And, and kind of once we've made those changes and made that plan and really clearly defined what we wanted to see and we set up our evaluation the way we wanted, um, now it's time to just try it out. And this is what initial implementation stage is all about. It's a very awkward stage where we're learning what works, what doesn't, and really figuring out how our first implementers, those clinicians using making the practice changes, are um, what their feedback is and, and how it's working and how it's going. So a really important component that we're going to talk about is not only um, that we tried out our plans, we put our practices in place specifically related to ASD diagnosis. May I have your attention, please? Yvonne Bowen, please call the switchboard. Yvonne Bowen, call the switchboard. Sorry about that. And then also, um, once those practices were in place, it's also it's also important for us to improve on things that um, need improvement and that may or may not be working. So it was really important that we had a process on how to make those changes. And um, those are called improvement cycles, or specifically, we can talk about our plan, do, study, act cycle. So just a quick reminder of what a plan, do, study, act cycle is. Um, it's a really systematic way to not only identify what change you want to make, but also make a plan for how you're going to address that change. So thinking about planning is what question are we trying to answer, and how are we going to address that change that we want to make. 
then we want to um, make a plan for, okay, how are we going, maybe a new strategy that we're going to try. Maybe we're going to make some changes to an existing form and see how it's going. And then we want to plan on, well, how do we know if that change is working? So do some collection or, of data or, or get some feedback from the staff. Um, and the frontline clinicians. Then we want to take some time to trial it and study it and uh, see what we learned from our data, what is our data telling us, and to see if that change or that new strategy that we tried out worked or did not work. If it worked, then we want to act and make the change and implement that change. If it didn't work, then we want to go back to plan and make a new plan and try a different strategy out um, to see if that will work uh, moving forward. So really, just, this is just about making small, quick changes um, to really ensure that the practice is being delivered the way you'd want it, the way you defined it in your practice profile, and to also give an opportunity to ensure that you're, you're getting the right feedback from your, your clinicians who are using the practice, and you're establishing the communication lines back and forth so that you're hearing how things are going and that you're sharing back how things are going as well. That's really important to engage um, the, the clinicians in making and sustaining the change. So Cindy's going to talk a little bit about some examples um, of the Plan, Do, Study Act and what we did to address these pieces. Okay, um, we're going to start off with the DSM-5 form, but I've already told you a little bit about how that works here. But for just to apply the PDSA cycle to that, we developed a form that addressed all the DSM-5 criteria. And I want to also point out that at the same time we were surveying the whole team, the diagnostic team, after each conference to look at whether they felt um, that the information from the developmental history, the psychological functioning, the communicative functioning, the structured observation were adequately considered in making the diagnosis. And then we also wanted to know how confident the team was in the actual diagnosis and that the DSM-5 criteria were applied effectively and all the team members' contributions were considered. So, so even though it seems cut and dry that there was just um, a change to a form, we were also asking feedback at the same time from all the clinicians about the whole process. So we did trial that form with more than 50 um, children's, well, more than 50 conferences or diagnostic conferences, and then collected team feedback. And we did lots of revisions to that form. So we, we trialed it, um, brought feedback back, trialed it again. So the cycle continued quite a few times. I think we probably made about six um, major revisions to that form. And then um, finally, uh, I think we're at the point now where we're, we're ready to apply for it to be um, considered a, a form that will be um, accepted by Alberta Health Services. So um, that one is pretty much in full implementation right now. So this is just a little bit of an example of what it actually looks like. It has, um, it has the uh, DSM-5 criteria, we've just chosen to um, include social communication on this slide because that's all that fits. But um, it, it's set up in a similar way to the ATN form, the Autism Treatment Network form, in that a, a, a criteria is either absent or present. And if it's present, we want to know did, did the team um, hear it, read it, um, or see it. And then there, there's also a column for notes, which is kind of quickly to jot down where that information actually came from. Okay, another example of our PDSA was chart audits. And as simple as this might sound, um, it's actually quite a, a bit of work to do. So uh, we did actually get some additional funding for this part of the project under a quality and Edmonton Zone Quality Improvement Grant um, because we needed to also apply for ethics so that we could do this data collection. Um, and then we developed a database for the chart audits to see if we had achieved ideal implementation. And this database isn't, is, it, it's related to a specific child, but who that child is doesn't actually matter. So, um, it, I mean, it doesn't matter for in terms of whether or not something was done with fidelity or not. So we are looking at, um, we have some critical information about that child, whether they're preschool or school-aged, 
um, and whether what their gender is, but we don't. Uh, I think we also have their age, but we don't have specific birth date or any information like that. So we did this audit both pre and post implementation because for most components we had um, an idea of whether something was being done before and after implementation. We got funding for the data collection. We hired a research assistant to develop the database and complete the chart audits. And then we did um, 50 chart audits uh, pre-implementation and 50 post-implementation. And we did 25 in each age, uh, either preschool or school-age children. And we're really just um, in the middle of studying that data right now and comparing the differences and examining both the strengths of what we've done in terms of implementation and the areas for improvement. And now we're going to begin working on looking at where we need, for example, more coaching, more communication, or more documentation. So here's just a few quick little examples of what the chart audit told us. Obviously, we have a, a big database that has um, a lot of information um, about each of the components of the um, practice profiles. And we did divide them by preschool and school age because they were, um, the process was a little bit different and the children came from different sources, from different clinics. So um, th those clinics were interested in their own um, PDSA activities. So the documentation of evidence for all DSM-5 criteria, we looked at only post-implementation um, because we didn't have a system previously to include all of that documentation. So you can see that we had no unacceptable and that it was the same for preschool and um, school age children. That, that documentation for, of evidence for all DSM-5 criteria was really quite well um, implemented. And I think that the reason it was so well, uh, the uptake was so good, is that it really made sense for clinicians. So I think when you're considering implementation, the clinicians will be the best guide of whether something is um, valued clinically or not. And this was obviously um, highly valued. So, you know, in terms of looking at what we might do to improve those five acceptable to become ideal, you know, it was interesting when we, we showed this data to the clinicians, obviously that's part of PDSA is to show, give people feedback really as quickly as possible. Um, they were very surprised that there were actually five children who didn't get that DSM-5 criteria. We're not sure what the issue is. It's most likely the form isn't getting onto the file because um, the coordinators are certain that all children have that form completed um, or that the form is actually not completed. So we're going to have to look at um, determining whether we need to improve documentation or how to ensure that the form is actually on the file. This is a little example of um, what the chart audit told us about structured observation. So for us, ideal implementation and structured observation was that the appropriate module of the ADOS-2 would be completed and interpreted by a research reliable ADOS-2 administrator. Um, and you can see here, we just, we're just showing you the preschool child, um, clinic data that we um, actually post-implementation have more unacceptable than pre-implementation. And uh, it's kind of, you know, I mean, you might want to speculate on why that is, um, and I'd be interested to know what you think it might be. But um, our initial thought was that we, we really do need to look at why, we're, why is it that um, five children did not receive the ideal implementation? Is it a staffing issue? Is it, a, is it the number of trained? Um, ADOS-2 administrators, or is it just the availability of those staff? Um, so we're, what we'll, we'll be doing is looking at um, any acceptable or unacceptable um, charts and, and trying to see what we can learn from them about what happened in those particular situations, because it might be that our systems have actually changed. What did our chart audit tell us in terms of the cognitive assessment? Well, here there's a little bit more variability. So here we're looking at school-age children, and um, if you add the acceptable and ideal, it, you know, it's actually pretty good. We only have two unacceptable um, pre and post, um, but definitely there are more ideals 
ideal implementations post-implementation of this whole process for school-aged children. Um, and in terms of acting to improve, we're not actually sure whether we can improve in this area. There are some system constraints related to um, the assess to an, a cognitive assessment in the clinic. Um, and we may decide to, to um, aim more for acceptable implementation, but we really do need to have some conversation with key stakeholders. That includes both um, community psychologists and in-house psychologists. So as you can see, in initial implementation, a lot of work is done on just um, looking at our data, uh, listening to our feedback, and figuring out um, what are really our next steps are. And you really will not know what your next steps are in initial implementation until you get that feedback and really start to think about, well, how can we, how can we do better? How can we make this work more efficiently? Or how we can make this work to be more ideal and, and meet the outcomes that we wanted to see in our practice that we defined in our practice profile. So in initial implementation, you work through all those changes using that PDSA cycle quite often. And full implementation is really about you're doing less of those improvement cycles. You're probably running less PDSAs. Things are probably working well. You're seeing a lot more ideal implementation versus unacceptables. And you're really, uh, the practice is kind of starting to become business as usual. It's, it's become part of your standard of practice, and it's just happening with very little, um, very little uh, reoccurring improvement cycles. So, but it's still important, though, in full implementation that the work isn't done. And we're really now just wanting to monitor and support um, the practice to ensure that it's still sustainable and it's still effective. So here are some of our full implementation activities that we're currently in. Um, and we also are still a little bit in initial implementation, as you can see from that data and some of the steps Cindy had talked about. So what are our activities in full implementation? Um, our implementation team has decreased the amount of time that it is meeting, but we're still meeting every second month to address some of these, um, these issues and see where we need to make improvements or changes. Um, we're continuing with our PDSA cycles, even though they're not as frequent. They might be more here or there, maybe more small changes. It's also that we're going to review some of those drivers that we talked about in our planning stage and thinking about how we can continue to support or improve our coaching, continue to communicate and share back information with staff and um, to our key stakeholders, and also... Miller, Sorry about that. And also to think about how better we can select and perhaps influence our hiring process specific to our teams with ASD diagnosis. And another big part of our role that um, that is really important for us is to share our, this work and to, just like we're doing right now, and to disseminate to key stakeholders and conferences. And we're considering even writing a paper about some of this work and the information that we presented, some of the information we presented today. So the next steps. Well, um, obviously, we're already working on spreading to other components of the diagnosis of ASD. So the occupational therapists are looking at what, um, what role they play in a diagnosis of ASD and building practice profiles and audit systems for themselves. It's easy to do, easier to do once um, you have some of the systems in place already. And it's also easier to do when you're looking at a single discipline. Um, we're looking at whether or not this can spread to other diagnoses. So I'll look at Gail. She's with us now. Um, potentially to FASD and ADHD, how those diagnoses are made, um, and explore the development of competency standards. Uh, that is definitely something that we are kind of moving towards. And I put competency in quotation marks because it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a scary word for people to think um, that they'll be measured on something. Um, we're going to collaborate with other service providers um, more, especially in schools and early education um, sites, so that we can integrate our findings more effectively. And that's already happening quite uh, 
quite specifically here at the Glen Rose. We're developing a sustainability plan for ongoing audits because obviously the research assistant won't be there all the time to do the actual audits of the files and so we'll need to build that into someone's role. And then we also need to build the coaching coordination role into an existing position because right now it is happening but it's not happening as consistently as it could. So we have some acknowledgments. First of all, we had an amazing input from our Autism Diagnosis Advisory Team, um, also from the Implementation Team, whose names you saw up on the, on the slide earlier. We had a lot of support from Glen Rose Senior Leadership, and then we had grant money um, initially to get the whole project off the ground from the Health Workforce Action Plan. Uh, oh, Red, building, That's not three. our building, just so you know. Physical therapy, room two, four, and it's going to go on for a little bit, Code so I'll just red, pause one, for a building, second and hope two, I don't lose too many physical people. Physical therapy, room 2416. I can't Code do anything red, about it. West building, level two. Physical therapy, room 2416. Okay, now it'll beep for a little bit longer. Uh, All right. Um, and then we also had a grant from an Edmonton Zone Quality Improvement Grant uh, to allow the work for the measurement to, um, to occur. We would like to thank you very much for participating. I know it was probably a lot of information, a lot of very specific information, and we'd be happy to share um, more specifics um, about the National Implementation Research Network framework that we're using. Um, I'll just put a little plug in that Laura is working with a, a cross Canada team on developing an implementation guide. Um, and uh, so we're happy to share our work on any of our specific projects and teams. Um, uh, if you're interested in autism, definitely in autism diagnosis and the implementation of best practice guidelines, you could contact me about that. And um, so, and you have our names up on the slides there. Uh, if you would like to reach any of us about this, that would be great. All right. Thank you. Once again, a great presentation. You know, really bringing in all of that that theory and all that information that you you presented last week and, and pre providing that that great you know example of how you implemented it. A great presentation. Um, so uh, while we're waiting for anyone to uh, type in any questions, uh, you know, that was an interesting uh, comment you made about potentially hearing from Gail about the opportunities to extend this to other diagnoses. I don't know, if, Gail, you haven't had much time to uh, uh, prepare, <laughs> but uh, just if you had any thoughts about. Uh, you know, sort of the next steps around extending this to uh, other diagnoses like FASD or any, any other diagnoses. Oh, great, Doug. Um, what I'd like to make a comment, people online may not know, but I am a developmental pediatrician, so I work as the, that cl clinic role in many clinics here at the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital. Um, and first of all, I'd like to comment as We've heard from our implementation scientists and researchers about this project, but I was one of the re clinical recipients of this work. And using uh, all of the, using the form and the approach to diagnosis of autism has really changed my thinking. It's given me some structure of how I interview the family and interact with the child. Um, and also what I've seen, I now have more consistency from case to case to case, because um, the teams do change up. I'm not always with the same psychologist or the same speech and language uh, pathologist, but I'm seeing this consistency coming. And what it also does, it stimulates a very rich discussion about the evidence. What have we seen? What have we heard? What have we measured during the assessment? Uh, so it really becomes a truly multi or interdisciplinary team conference. Uh, so I think the, the diagnosis, we're much more confident at the end of, of, of using this approach. And the other thing that I've noticed, because we also look at some sort of levels of severity in our discussions, it really helps us formulate the recommendations after the assessment that will then go to support the child, family, and the community service providers. And it's actually very user friendly, by the way. It doesn't add more time to your assessment process. So putting on my hat as medical director of the Glen Rose Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Clinical and Research Services, 
um, this is the right time to start to look at this uh, process of change and implement best evidence. Because as uh, some people online may or may not know, there uh, will be new Canadian guidelines for the diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder um, expected to be published at some point in this year, in 2015. This replaces the older guidelines in 2005 that were published in CMAJ in, I think it was March 2005. So the time is right. We have the new guidelines. We, using this implementation science approach to those new guidelines gives us an opportunity uh, to, to really explore all the diagnostic categories the components of the diagnostic team, and then moving into, again, the, the, the right tests, the right people for the right information. A diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is expensive. It, it has been estimated to be about $4,000 per case. If we use uh, this approach to really honing in on what are the essential components of diagnosis, could we be um, more cost effective? Could we be more efficient? So lots of good questions. So I'm very excited to um, ho hopefully we can initiate the FASD the implementation process as soon as the new guidelines come out. Great. Well, that might be another implementation team that we can get going. I just want to reiterate that it doesn't mean when we're doing this implementation work that we're that something isn't already good. It's just about getting, it's not just about, but it, a big component of, of it is, is increasing confidence by getting everything that, um, to be sustainable and um, standardized. So that, not, not that you're doing a standardized assessment, but that you're doing a certain assessment. That, that you can be sure that each child that is seen or um, for a particular intervention or a particular um, assessment is getting the best possible treatment or assessment done. And just to add to that, and know, and creating a system to know if that's actually happening and why. Right. So measurement is a big part of implementation science. That whole concept is, is you have to know whether you're doing a good job. I think that's, that's pretty much our bottom line. I see our attendees are dropping. Are there any other questions that people have? Right, so I don't think we have any any questions at this point. Um, so uh, you know maybe we'll just move on to some you know any closing comments that you want to have at the end of this this two part series as far as you know your your experience. I mean we've already heard some great great input from Gail that really sort of rounded it out as far as where how how you extend this and the opportunities and bringing in that economic piece. Like it's not just about outcomes. That's extremely important. But if you can make yourself more efficient and cost effective, that's a real opportunity there as well. So we, some real great stuff. But you know perhaps any closing comments just to sort of round out the two sessions. <laughs> Not our closing comment. That means that, means that the fire is over. <laughs> Cold red is all clear. Cold red is all clear. Cold red, all clear. All right. So I, this is Laura. I just wanted to say that um, that I hope that over this two-part series that. We've really been able to demonstrate that even though this is an overwhelming amount of information, it is very practical. It is a it is a thoughtful, practical approach to really um, moving your research or your evidence or your you know your best practice into practice in in a more thoughtful way so that you you are seeing changes that really can impact our families and our patients in a positive way, and that. Um, people's takeaway is that it's not just about what you're implementing, but that it's just as equally as impro important to consider um, the environment in which you're implementing in and also to have a process that, um, that is, has some strong evidence behind it to support that evidence that you're trying to implement. So it's really about those three components, what you're implementing, how you do it, and, and where, what your environment that you're implementing is. So um, hopefully we've been able to reinforce some of that with the, our practical examples today. All right. I'm I, sure. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
one more little thing, and I'm just happy to say that you know Laura and I have now worked on quite a few different implementation teams, and it's getting easier and easier for us to get this off the ground. So initially, although it took quite a bit of time and effort to get this project and the Spinal Cord project and a few other ones off the ground, now we've, um, we're, we're much more comfortable with the system, and we're much more comfortable in leading teams to the place where they need to go. Uh, and at scale, we're actually at the Glen Rose doing a, currently a lot of work on transitions of youth with complex developmental and health needs into the adult system of care. And we're at the early stages of this work, and we're using this pro whole implementation knowledge to inform our practice of transition. And I know transitions, uh, through all of the work of TAFSI is doing on transitions, is a very, very important pan-Canadian topic. So again, we'll be happy to share our learnings from our transition work with, with others across the country. We've got two new transition teams, implementation teams started, so that'll be good. All right, lots of stuff to look forward to then. So, uh, thanks very much for you know a great presentation for spending two weeks with us. It really was fantastic, and as you said, a ton of information. So, uh, I'm sure there will be lots of people who will be going back to the recordings. As we mentioned at the beginning, we always uh, record our webinars. Uh, the webinars that we do every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, we always do record them, uh, and you can always reach these or see these record the recordings on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. As I mentioned, it takes a couple of uh, days to get that information up, but I'm sure lots of people will want to check back. So so thanks to uh, Cindy and Laura, and uh, as always for Gail for joining us as our co-host and co-facilitator on these sessions. Uh, next week, uh, we've got uh, our first episode of our three-part series on patient safety that's uh, sponsored by uh, Icaria, now part of Mallinckrodt Pharma Pharmaceuticals. Um, the first episode is titled Patient Safety After 15 Years, The Dis Disappointments, Successes, and What's on the Horizon, where we will have uh, Dr. Trey Coffey and uh, Dr. Kaveh Shojanya give us a sense of what the patient safety movement has accomplished and where the focus is now and, and maybe a little bit about uh, what we haven't accomplished that we thought we should have. So it should be an interesting uh, session. Uh, part two, we now have some information on the Knowledge Exchange Network for the part two of the patient safety, patient safety series, which will be uh, designing for patient safety, how design can influence patient safety. And that's uh, talking about uh, how the design of our physical environments, medical devices, our documentation, our, uh, how we organize our information, how all of that can affect the safety of our patients and our op and opportunities to improve safety. Uh, and for that session, we'll be bringing uh, Wayne Ho from Health Human Factors and Kim Streitenberger from ISMP Canada uh, to that session. And then on June 3rd, uh, we will be talking about uh, obesity in children with physical disabilities. Uh, clinical dilemmas and research priorities. Um, and th for that, we'll be uh, talking about issues related to childhood obesity that might be unique or within the context of ch children with diabetes, uh, diabetes, with disabilities. And for this session, we'll be welcoming uh, Amy McPherson and Julia Lyons from the Holland Blurview Rehabilitation Hospital. So very excited about that session. And thanks to uh, Prolacta Bioscience for helping support that webinar. So some great, uh, uh, great information and great webinars coming up in the next couple weeks. So thanks for joining us today, and we hope to see you back here uh, next week. Bye, everyone.